So what we're doing at Nimric is we're trying to use this to create this in a way that we have lots of scenes like this and none of that and definitely none of that and that's my story. <laughs> Uh, so I wish I could credit myself with these slides. For, uh, they, they're from a partner of mine in Oregon, uh, Jason Bush, who's the executive director of the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. But really, that does tell the story of what we're trying to do when we look at marine energy. So let's get a little bit more into the, into the weeds, or, or maybe in the, into the kelp, as the case may be. So uh, people will ask me, why, why are we interested in wave energy in Oregon? Why are we inter interested in wave energy on the West Coast in general? And so if you look at this map, good wave energy is where you see the orange and the red colors. And it, it, it's on the West Coast of continents. And that's because the waves are created by the winds. And the winds blow across the ocean from the west side of the ocean to the east side of the ocean. So that by the time you get to the west coast of the continents, these waves are piling up. So anywhere from roughly uh, a little bit it's south of here, all the way up into Alaska, you've got great waves in the U.S. So about, uh, in 2008, U.S. Department of Energy decided they wanted to start looking at the marine renewable technologies, and they put out a funding opportunity announcement to create up to three centers that they called their national, their NIMRECs, their National Marine Renewable Energy Centers. And one popped up in Florida Atlantic University, and they're looking at ocean currents, so taking energy from the Gulf Stream and ocean thermal energy. One popped up in Hawaii, and they're looking at wave and ocean thermal. The reason they're looking at wave is, uh, as Dan just mentioned, the Navy has a facility there that's testing some wave energy devices. And then the third center is, is NEMREC. We're led by Oregon State University. It's a partnership with the University of Washington. Uh, OSU is focused on the wave side because of our great wave resource on the coast. And Washington's focused on tidal because of the great tidal resource in Puget Sound and around the islands. So what uh, U.S. Department of Energy said is we don't want you to simply to be a uh, university center that does basic research, but we would like you to work to facilitate commercialization of this industry. We'd like you to work with the developers and help them understand what's going on with their devices. We want you to help inform the regulatory agencies and the government um, groups that make policy decisions. And since you are universities, we do want you to work on the education and research side. And so uh, when I look back, I wasn't director at the time we got the grant. I've been the director for about a year and a half. And when I look back and think why uh, OSU and University of Washington were selected, one reason is because we had strength in what I call the three legs of the stool. When you start talking about this industry, I think most people latch onto the technical side. And when you look at the leaders in this industry, they're all in the United, or they're all in Europe. Up, mostly in the United Kingdom right now, and they are definitely focused on the technical side. The engineering, the oceanography, the mooring systems, the vessels that you use, you use to deploy it. But when you start getting into the environment, um, environmental side, even though they don't want to believe it, their regulatory system is much simpler than ours. Um, and, and I'll take it to the extreme and say, when somebody in the UK wants a device in the water, the Crown Estate says, it shall be, and it happens. And it's, it's not quite that simple. But they, they definitely don't have um, the, the same sort of focus on what the environmental impacts are that we seem to face in the US. And, that, and I think it's a good thing that our, that our regulators are concerned about what we're putting in our waters. And then the third side that I think scientists forget is the social side. We have people who live on these coasts who worry about what the view sheds will be. Who, we've got fishermen who worry um, that, their, that their best fishing grounds are going to be taken away. And we've been engaged in a territorial sea planning process in Oregon that's coming to a close. But it's been going on for about three or four years, trying to decide where in our, in our waters we believe would be good for these devices. Um, so I'm not going to get into all these details. I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the work going on at OSU in research. I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the work that my students and I are doing. And then I'm going to talk about where I think
think the, the industry is headed. Um, and so one of the things I want to point out while I'm at, at this slide is we've heard a little bit about the ups, I'll call it the ups and downs of solar and wind, in the sense that they come and they go, and they come and they go. One of the cool things about waves that the, um, the utilities are particularly excited about is it's a much more predictable resource. We can predict what's going to happen with the wave resource 84 hours out, and that's one of the things that researchers at OSU have done for the entire Oregon coast. And in addition to that, it's not so much the up and down, well, it is up and down, that's what waves do, right? Um, but in, in terms of the, you know, the 24 hour cycles and that thing, it's a much longer period of when the waves are, are large than the waves are small. Um, so that helps evening out with these other uh, sources of, of renewables. And so I firmly believe that as we move toward an energy future that's made up of renewables, we will see this portfolio that comes together in this nice integrated way that helps balance out the various attributes that are available in different, um, different regions. Um, and that picture at the bottom, by the way, is the Hatfield Marine Science Center at Newport, Oregon, which is a wonderful gem that we have available to us. It's an OSU asset, but located there, we have the NOAA fleet. We have NOAA um, marine fisheries. We've got EPA. We've got um, all kinds of agencies. So it's kind of one-stop shopping for us in addition to having OSU's ship operations and uh, those pieces there. So I'm going to talk about the first kind of device that I think people think about when you think about wave energy. So people say, how do you get energy from the waves? Well, the, the, the one thing people think of is heaves. Waves go up and down. But you also, waves also go back and forth, and waves kind of move around a little bit. So anything you can put in the water that's going to move with those waves, you could theoretically produce energy from. And so this is work that was done from one of our master students a little while ago. And so she took a buoy. Um, that's got this uh, float that goes up and down. It's got a damper plate at the bottom that holds the structure in place and some mooring system. And the, the way this, the energy is um, produced in this device is you've got a coil in the spar in the center and magnets in that buoy that go up and down producing, um, producing energy. But in, in any of these systems, you have some sort of dynamic moving up and down. You have some sort of power takeoff, some sort of generator. And so um, to model this energy from heave, you can just do force equals mass times acceleration. And when you do that, you have all the different sources of force on this device. And so if we dissect these various pieces, you actually begin to find a lot of the research going on at OSU right now in the electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and civil engineering groups. So if you look at the excitation force on the float from the wave, there's some very complicated work using LS Dyna modeling fluid structure interactions um, on those devices. And then out of, um, out of that work, I'm trying to work with one of my students to come up with reduced order models that are tractable for real-time estimation and control of these devices. Because while you think these devices might do just best just to leave them in there and, and not muck with them, some of them can actually produce more energy if you put a control back on the device. Um, another kind of work that's being done at OSU is what they're calling life extending control. The idea that some of these devices subjected to something like a 100 year storm, if you just let them go, they might actually go into failure modes or be stressed beyond their structural integrity. So if we use the control to, to tamp it down and, and control the dynamics, we actually could increase the reliability, sustainability, and, and really the cost of energy because you're um, extending the, uh, the lifetime of this device. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the details here, but you can imagine we're doing resource on power, power takeoff and how different power takeoffs might affect what kind of energy you get out of the device. And so we put these into, into computational models and simulations, and we can put in uh, real um, wave data that we've got and see what happens. So the, the red line there is, is the dynamics at the top is the dynamics of that damper plate. So you don't want to see that moving around. And it's good. We're not seeing that moving around very much. And then what you're seeing in the blue is what the buoy's doing. Uh, and then the other squiggly line there that's a little bit orange is the wave height. So you can get some simulation data. And of course, then what we want to do is put these devices in the water and gather the same data and use this to validate and verify our models. 
So what's the real goal when, if you're going to design a, a wave energy device? The real goal, and this comes from a friend of mine, Dr. Stefan Siegel, who uh, is, is a professor at the Air Force Academy and a developer of a device, is you're really trying to terminate a wave. So if you think about a wave coming across the ocean, or a wave tank per, per se, and if you are going to put a wave energy converter in it that uh, generates another wave, and if you sync them up so they're absolutely opposing each other with the same phase and same amp or you know the opposite phase and same amplitude, then when you turn that wave energy converter off, it's going to cancel that wave and it's extracting the maximum energy from that wave. So it's interesting because Stefan is a, is an aerospace engineer, and he said, "What I want to do is put an, a wing in the water and pitch it." So that as it goes across the water, it creates a peak. And he said, I know I can do that from aerodynamics and looking at the pressures on a wing. And he said, similarly, if I pitch it in another direction, I can create a trough. So Stefan's idea is, if you knew what the wave is coming in, and you could pitch these wings so that you create waves to cancel the troughs, and create troughs to cancel the, the peaks, then you would be extracting maximum energy. So what he has is a cycloidal WEC that has these two uh, hydrofoils pitched in such a way that when you spin the, the, the cycloidal WEC, it'll create peaks and troughs. And then when you time it with the wave that's coming in, you can perfectly cancel the wave. And in his nice little wave tank, he gets 95% extraction of the energy. And I think that's lovely. However, I would like to see in the ocean with the regular waves not coming from the same direction and not having the same height, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of my goals would be to get Stefan's device in the water to see what actually happens. So again, our, our mission at NEMRIC is to facilitate commercialization by helping the developers really see what's happening. So before we get devices in the water, one of the things we're interested in is environmental studies. Because again, we have to work with the regulators to inform them about what happens in these devices. And so because of our work uh, with Hatfield, because of all the marine biology we have there and all the history we've got, it's been really great because we have lots of information about what happens in the seabed, the, the benthic ecosystem, and the organisms that live there, and what kind of cycles they go through. Some, some critters go through a quarterly cycle. Some go through an annual cycle. So it gives us insights as to how often we'd want to test once we put a wave energy device in the water. Um, I wasn't sure at first why, we're, why seabird colony studies would be an issue. I was thinking, are the, the seabirds going to land on the devices? But actually what they're concerned about are these devices in the water being lit up and changing migratory patterns. That could be a big deal. Um, as we're moving forward with testing, two of the things that, that the regulators are very concerned about are acoustics and electromagnetic fields. Acoustics, because if these devices are too loud, they might interrupt marine mammal communications, and electromagnetic fields, because salmon are part particularly susceptible to those. So we have a whole host of environmental uh, studies that we've done both as bent, a baseline before putting devices in the water, and as we move toward devices in the water, we will continue to do these studies. So uh, moving toward the, the testing support now. Now here's where, where it gets kind of fun, because we not only get to validate these paper and simulation studies like I've shown you, but we get to work with developers and get our hands on stuff. So we have two of the best wave tanks globally for testing wave energy devices. The picture in the middle there is called our large wave flume. It's a wave tank. You can think of it as a 2D slice of the ocean. It's 104 meters long and about 5 meters deep and 4 meters wide. And people will put scaled devices in there and subject them to uh, regular wave profiles, just again, 2D slice. 100-year um, storms, see how their mooring systems work, see what happens when these devices really get excited. And then on the far right there, I've got a picture of our tsunami basin, which is a little bit more uh, squarish. It's got 29 panels in the back that can move independently and create real, real wave scenarios. And what we've got there is a picture of an array of devices being tested. And all those little sticks sticking up our measurement system called a, a phase space system that can measure to sub, to sub millimeter accuracy in terms of the dynamics of those devices. 
And then uh, the top picture there is a device called the WET NZ, Wave Energy Technology New Zealand, that tested there. And you can see they're going, undergoing a particularly energetic test. That might have been one of those 100-year storm scenarios that I was mentioning. So once the developers test in the tanks, the next thing they want to do is go in the ocean. And we've been developing this test facility in Newport, Oregon for about the last two or three years. It's in the, the dark blue square there. Uh, Newport, Oregon, I mentioned that where Hatfield was. That's uh, uh, indicated with an arrow over there. That uh, our test facility is on the territorial sea, which means it's, or it's on the edge of the territorial sea, which means it's on the border uh, of three nautical miles away from shore. It's one nautical mile square, so that means the nearest side is two nautical miles away. The depth is between 45 meters at the shallowest, 55 meters at the deepest. And so the way developers uh, are wanting to test out there is connected to what we're calling our ocean sentinel. So what I have in this picture for you, at the top you've got a little circular buoy. That's an environmental measuring device. That would measure what's happening with your wave heights, your currents, those kind of things. And in the middle, I have a wave energy converter under test. And it's connected by an umbilical cable to our test buoy called the Ocean Sentinel. So the role of the Ocean Sentinel is to record what's happening. It records the environmental data. It, re it, re it records the energy being produced at the device. It can sync those things up for the developers to analyze what's happening. It, um, in the case that a device needs to be actively controlled, as I mentioned, we can feed power back and we can dissipate the power that the device had produced. And so it was very exciting this summer because, oh, I missed my slide. We tested this before I started. Okay, let's try this again. Maybe I just need to be patient. There we go. Because we had our first test in the ocean this summer. So this is a fully permitted, uh, uh, fully permitted site. We went through all the rigmarole. And I shouldn't say that, because it's, it's a good process. But it, it can be hair pulling at times. But all the things that the regulators want to do to make sure that these devices in the ocean are safe for all the things that live there. And that was supposed to loop on you. So my, apologize, my apologies. But um, let, me, let me go back to that. OK, the device nearest us is that wet NZ I mentioned that was in the tank. So the developers test in the tank, and then they come out in our ocean. This device works by that orangey float going up and down, generating energy. That structure, yellow structure can go back and forth as well. This is a fairly calm day out there. And the ocean sentinel is over there in the corner. So you can kind of get a sense of what that thing looks like. So what, did, what do these devices look like? Yeah, again, I mentioned the buoy. And I mentioned that the communities are very concerned about um, what the view shed is going to look like. Well, some devices sit on the bottom. This is a device called the Oyster. It's made by a company in Scotland called Aquamarine. And it sits near the shore. And it goes back and forth like this, like an oyster shell would, as the, the waves go back and forth. Here's a device that sits on the shore. It's called Limpet. It's in, also in Scotland. It's been installed since about 2000. It's called an oscillating water column. As the waves come up onto the shore, they push the air out through a turbine. The turbine spins. As the waves go back out, it sucks the air back through a turbine spin, kind of like a spouting horn like we have on our west coast. Um, this is an, a device called the Penguin. Looks a little bit like a boat, except it's extremely rocky. I hear it's very nauseating to be on. In the inside, it's got a horizontal pendulum, just like a self-winding watch. So it really wants this thing to rock so that the pendulum spins, spins around. Here's a device called the Palamus. It's also called a sea snake. It sits on top of the water. And as the waves go under it, it goes like this, producing energy. The latest incarnation of this device is about 600 feet long. And I thought, man, that's got to be huge in the water. What was really interesting is I saw one about a mile from shore, and I could cover it up by putting my thumbs together. So it wasn't quite as daunting as I expected. Here's a device. Here's this power buoy that everybody thinks is going to be out there. This is by a company called Ocean Power Technologies. It was deployed in Hawaii for about four or five years. They have per, a permit to deploy 10 of them off of Reedsport, Oregon. And they hope to get in the water this year. It's going to be next spring. 
<clears throat> Here's a device called Columbia Power Technology C-Ray. Uh, this was in Puget Sound for about a, a year. This is an interesting device that has, it, it's anchored to the bottom, the spar can go back and forth, and it's got floats on top that move around. So lots of dynamics going on. And their latest incarnation, apparently the floats can flip around each other. So even more energy is being produced through the dynamics of the water. Now here's a device that I like to show people because it has no view shed. This one's completely under the water. It's a device by a company called M3, and it works by the, the waves creating differences in the pressure column, essentially pressuring airbags that, that send the water, uh, send air going back and forth and spinning turbines. And then the last one again, there's the wet NZ again with the float and the, the um, st structure there. So you can see there's a huge different um, array of devices that people are looking at. Now, I showed you the Ocean Sentinel. When we're testing with the Ocean Sentinel, we can only test devices that are up to about 100 kilowatts. And you saw the graph in Henry's talk of 100 kilowatts going up to a megawatt. Uh, the industry really wants to be testing things at the scale of a megawatt. So at this point in time, what they have to do is they have to go to Europe. The premier test facility for wave energy right now is EMEC, the European Marine Energy Center up at the Orkney Islands. And that's where I saw the Palamis device installed. They have four, um, they've got four deep water sites and two shallow water sites where you can test devices up to about a megawatt scale. And for developers in the US, this, is, it, this isn't the best news because first of all, if you want to test there, you've got to pay all the transportation costs of getting there or set up a supply chain to manufacture there. And moreover, they're contracted for the next five years. So this is really a tough deal for them. So what we've been doing at NEMREC is pushing with USDOE that we want to open the utility scale grid connected test site for wave energy in Oregon. And that's what's the, the exciting news for us is they have given us the first installment of funding toward PMEC, the Pacific Marine Energy Center. And so I have been working on getting a site selected for this, this uh, grid connected site. It will either be in Newport, Oregon or Reedsport, Oregon. And we will know this by the end of the year. And so this is really exciting for developers. I just had somebody call me today asking when it would be open to test because they're really looking to move the, move the industry forward in the United States. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave you. This is one of the things we're supposed to do at the site is look at marine mammal interactions. And this little seal out there was really having a great time. Uh, the guys who caught this video said that he, he even tried to jump up on the device. But, uh, but so see, even the seals are happy about wave energy. <laughs> so thank you very much.